Hey guys, welcome to Moonlight. My name is Oliver Belanger. This is a side project club for people that don't know it yet. Uh, we meet once a week at 9 p.m. So I'm gonna start with the pictures. So my side project is Moonlight. It's this, it's this community. And that's what I work on, is building up this community and providing resources for you and everyone involved. Uh, some of those things include like the video camera and the projector such that we can record our pitches and then look at them later, uh, which is a really, really, really useful thing to do. Looking at your self-pitch, it like shows so many things that you didn't realize you were doing that uh, you then realize you do. For example, yesterday, last night, I was spending a bunch of time work, uh, editing the video from last week, and I realized that I do this thing a lot when I'm not paying attention, and so now I'm consciously like not doing that thing to just then to show you. So you learn a lot from watching yourself pitch. Other things I'm doing is I've set up a system on GitHub for uh, applying to demo, as well as uh, applying to bring speakers in. It's very, very simple. It's a markdown page on GitHub in the collaborative repo. If you're not part of the repo yet, uh, put your GitHub handle on the Moonlight channel, and I'll add you to the repo as a collaborator, or all collaborators, which means we all have the mute button, Please don't press it. Uh, yeah, so it's these markdown files. Uh, one of them is called guest speakers. One of them is called demo speakers. The demo speaker one is very simple. It's a markdown table. You go in, you enter the information, and you're done. The guest speaker markdown file is also very simple. It's a table. You go in, you enter the information that is required of you, and you're done. Both of these times, I will then reach out to you to coordinate and such. Uh, so that's some of the new development going forward. Uh, we finally figured out all the AV shit, which is awesome. So like, this is ready to go. Uh, the camera's ready to go. I also realized that none of you got any of the video from last week or this week, which means you had no ability to look at what you did and then improve upon it, which is stupid. Which means that after Moonlight, every week, I'm gonna be doing video editing and trying to get you that footage uh, the night of. It's not like some crazy video editing. There's some more video editing stuff that I need to do for the Saras talk because it's like a talk and that's gonna go on the Facebook page and yada yada yada. How bad was the audio? It's actually okay. The audio okay. is actually okay. It's staticky and annoying, but it's actually okay. Because okay. in the future, as this develops more and more, we can have more and more internal tools like a website and everything, right? I imagine all of these things will develop over time, but like we're not there yet. We will though first team that wants to do it, which seems to be the big winner's the team. The winning team. <laughs> the, 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 the team with the most Moonlight members. <clears throat> cough, cough. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so we built, uh, what do we build, guys? Like, what's the fish deal? Uh, inventory management as a service. So the idea is- Wait, before wait. you start, I'm actually, this is gonna be fun, I'm actually gonna time you. Yeah. You're gonna have literally 30 seconds to do the pitch. Okay. Uh, 30 seconds and then I can like actually and then you can actually talk about the stuff yeah cool and go okay so it's inventory management as a service for pharmaceutical companies the idea is at like a really high level uh, we don't want pharmacists to have to worry at all about uh, being pill managers and dealing with the, the day to day of just managing their inventory we want to take make their entire priority be their customers uh, so that's high level cut it 21 seconds <laughs> uh, I'm just embarrassed. Uh, so yeah, what are some hack things we did? For our, our actual like prediction algorithm, yeah. it was just like a formula that Ian thought of at the last, uh, like, because we were kind of running out of time. Yeah, so that was kind of fun. If you notice the actual screen, when like, we made like a order for like 120 or something, <coughs> and it told us to order 32 more. So like, kind of hacky. Uh, the other thing is like, we got called out for like the Twilio, uh, like, you, like having it send a text. That's literally one line of code, like a <laughs> single line. So it's not like, that was like not even like a thing that we spent much time on at all. We just like set it up and it did it. Uh, so yeah, other cool things that we did. Anybody else, any thoughts? Uh, I mean, what was, what was kind of cool is just that we spent a lot of time trying to like work on each piece. So like we had like a front end component, uh, like a server component, and then uh, like, the, the, like building out like a full database. And one thing that I thought was super interesting was how we could actually solve problems at different spots. So like, for example, we could use a SQL command and like, or a SQL query 
uh, and like do database side like searching through all the records and grabbing the right stuff. Or we could just return a ton of records and then use Python uh, in our Flask uh, server to like search through everything and do it there. So there's like multiple ways. Like there's one point where like one of the commands wasn't working right, like on the database. So like I was building out an implementation in Python in the, on the server, and then it ended up being that the we got the database command to work. So like we kind of had multiple ways of like going about it, uh, which was really cool, especially because we had a, an awesome dynamic team that was all like interested in different parts and working on different stuff. So it was really cool and a lot of fun. And uh, thanks. What's Twilio? <laughs> so uh, one of Oliver's potential old career paths was was with Twilio. Uh, Twilio is an awesome company. They kind of manage, or they manage like all of the texting and like phone calls, like automating that whole process. Uh, it's a really cool service. You can sign up and get like a free phone number for X amount of time, and then eventually it runs out, and I don't even know when it does that. But they can choose a new one and they'll make another one. Uh, you can only send text to like verified numbers, so you can't just like spam text everybody. Uh, and like in order to verify a number, you have to like get a text response or a phone call response. It's not like you can just put in everybody's numbers from intra and then just like start having it text everybody, as fun as that would be. Uh, but yeah, it's a cool company. Uh, they have a really, really good dev evangelism program. So uh, if anybody like starts to go to a lot of hackathons, you'll probably run into them again, particularly if you happen to be in New York for whatever reason. Because well, they have a, their, they just, their dev evangelism team just gets pretty much kicked out anyway. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so yeah, any other questions about anything that we did? What were you trying to predict uh, for the invention hypothesis? So the idea was basically to predict how much stock they would need any given week, and like should they get below a certain threshold, like re-up that order, uh, and then like be predicting so that you don't have to re-up uh, as much, basically, but, but also like, more keeping stock size low. Mm -hmm. So like the idea is to shift it so that ideally, like given enough data and uh, given a, a tested enough algorithm, I guess, uh, the uh, pharmacists wouldn't have to spend any time worrying about whether or not their pills are there, uh, which would be really cool. And the algorithm that I use, algorithm, which is a bunch of averages, and then I just threw some random numbers in there, and then we absolutely valued it, so it was always positive. Yeah, because we, we, did, we did it once, and they turned out negative, yeah, so we were like a negative, negative order. <laughs> So we were like, let's just make it no, sure. No, in my head how it worked was that like, if it was negative, that just meant we didn't need to order any. But for some odd reason, it popped up in the order table <laughs> as negative, which means we still needed to order some. I don't know, it's weird. So you got this data from some open source? Uh, no, no, this is all dummy data. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we, we just seeded our, okay. our, our SQL database mm -hmm. and, and worked with that data. I had all the like uh, algorithms to do all of the things that we wanted to do. So like that goes into like, holding costs, uh, storage costs, uh, reorder costs, which we can't really, or supply costs, we can't really like calculate that because we don't know the suppliers, we don't know mm -hmm. how much this costs and all that stuff. So I kind of figured that out something random. Yeah, props to Mason for getting a whole bunch of real data. Yeah, like, <coughs> really cool for for his project. Basically, uh, when we sat down to make our project, I actually said, hey, why don't we do something about stock? And then they literally said, no, that doesn't have to do with pharmacies. And then we were like, okay, we'll write something for the pharmacist. And our idea was, okay, let's take all the pills, the patients and stuff, and the medication and say, hey, this interacts with this. You probably shouldn't prescribe this. This is the doctor messing up. And that was the general idea was to say, hey, let's take work away from the pharmacist by letting the computer tell them whether or not the doctor messed up ahead of time. Good. 27 seconds. Woo. All right. Saving lives. Yeah, not really. <laughs> it's just it's just a way to let pharmacists be uh, whatever. So it was really simple. It was pretty much just like doing string compares through a uh, database and see that we just made a really teeny one. We literally just did get next line with string compare to make <laughs> oh, everything yeah. work. Yeah. Wait, wait. So, so how did this database exactly look? Basically, uh, we had patient files and drug files. And so basically the patient, there'd be one patient file and it'd read the name and then it'd say, here's the prescriptions we want to do like Xanax, Zoloft, whatever the fuck, this person's depressed as shit. <laughs> Anyway, and then it's like, okay, so then here they already have pre-existing medical conditions like heart failure or already depression. So it's like, you know, let's make sure that we don't give them anything that actually increases depression or gives them heart palpitations or whatever. So then you just do a whole bunch of related term searches and are like, okay, well, if these are present in here and they're also present in the side effects, you know, maybe we should highlight a thing that says, hey, the doctor says they need to do this. Like, we also have the instructions. So the way to print out is it would be, 
I did the colors for the text printout. <laughs> That's about it. I, I made the pretty colors. So I can add that to my printout now. Anyway, so put in magenta the prescription. And then below that, if everything was fine, it would say, okay, this doesn't have any interactions with medications. And then below that, let's say it has a interaction with the pre-existing condition, it'd say, warning, colon. Patient has pre-existing condition, this pill also causes this. You know, might want to do that. And then underneath all that, it printed out in yellow the instructions. So then I would say, hey, doctor prescribed, take this two or three times a day with a meal, water, whatever. So then I would just do that. And so that way, like, you know, uh, let's say the person, I don't know, has cancer of the stomach. And so even if you know the pills have no conflicts, if that person has to eat this with a meal, maybe there's a better option that they can do. And then like, because what we really interpreted the prompt as is like, hey, the doctor could mess up, and then the pharmacist is going to have to call them while the person's walking to them. So it's like, this is why it's all just clear, black and white. Hey, this is bad. This is good. This is what the doctor prescribed. And the pharmacist can go, are you, are you out of your fucking mind? <laughs> Before the patient gets there and basically is like, OK, well now we'll just give you this new medication. That was the general idea and purpose. And like I said, the database was simple. Like, uh, you could just scrape it from like a database or something, like a WebMD database or something. W was there a database we could have used? This is well, something I'm not entirely clear on. the drugs, like you could use drugs.org. Yeah, essentially, yes. Yeah. We were just <laughs> really just basically, yeah, drugs.com, we were just straight up typing in, like, you know, versions of stuff. We could make patients who conflicted and who didn't. And then basically, if you were able to run it, it, we had Corey in there. He had a couple of conflicts. Then we had Bill, whatever, who was really freaking depressed. Yeah, Bob Smith, he's really depressed. But no conflicts in his thing. He was just like, okay, give him the drugs. Give him the drugs, make him feel happy. And then there was someone else. <laughs> yeah, there was some other people who was like, you know, like, okay. And then we have, like, one where it does this, like, basically showing that, yeah, the whole thing actually worked properly the way it was supposed to. So, yeah. And though I will say, adding on to your thing is that my idea went a step further. It's like, by the way, we'll let you order laser cut acrylic boxes to store all the pills in. So that way everything fits nice and perfect. Instead of having these, like, you know, those little troughs. Nice. So, yeah, like, it would have gone an extra step. But they were just like, no, this is stupid. That has nothing to do with a pharmacy. And then you guys win. And I'm like, that's close enough. Okay. So, yeah, nothing else to say about that. Right, Tori? <laughs> to create a, uh, a way for the doctor and pharmacist and customer to all interact through one platform. So essentially, like, the doctor would, or you, you uh, the customer would come, the customer would use the app um, to find, locate a doctor, like local in the area or whatever, and so you would go over there to the doctor and and, hey, that's all right. Let's get into the engineering challenge. So just talk about it. So like, what's yeah. an engineering challenge that you guys face and, and what do you guys do to, to get around it? So a couple of the engineering, originally we started with doing Android. So we, you know, downloaded Android Studio. There were a couple hiccups <coughs> here and there with on these Macs. <laughs> and so, we finally got that up mostly. Some people are using their own laptops, and others are actually got it working on the Mac. And so we, st none of us have like any real experience with Android. Like I've done like little stuff, like maybe you know text box, modifying a button, modifying a text box, simple stuff. And so we were all just kind of trying to learn Android. And coming from C, it's kind of very different. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> what does that entail? Um, essentially, building a UI from the ground up with MiniLibX. <laughs> so, with min the library functions we use for MiniLibX were basically, basically the uh, string MLX string put. So you can put a, a string on the screen, oh and so I created a struct called TextBox. Which stores basically how to render the text box. So, like the line or the what I call the title, the bit before the actual text box, describing what you know, you're supposed to put in the text box. Box, for example, like username was one of the things we did, and and then I, inside that struct is a um, basically a buffer.
for to store the content of that um, of that text box. And essentially, what you have to do is every time, and then I use key events using the the key hook to um, capture key key codes. And then just I looked up the looked up the um, conversion, and then you see an array of all the key codes in order, it's like the actual letters associated with the key codes. And then essentially, just every time you press a key, it add, it adds a adds a character to the uh, string. And then every time you delete, it just erases the character or places it replaces it with null and moves your cursor back. Where cursor is essentially just an index of the array. And so it was very hacky, just building from the ground up. Text boxes. Yeah. That's so so uh, why did you go with a pentagram over the anarchy symbol, which also has five points? <laughs> <laughs> a pentagram over the... Um, honestly, I was working on code the entire time. I did not see those slides until you just... <laughs> <laughs> Put the pentagram there. Uh -huh. Was it Wade? Wade. Wade. Huh? Who was in charge of the presentation? Wade. Yeah, of I'm course. Not surprised <laughs> at all. Did anyone see the presentation at all until you got the Yeah. Up? Okay. Yeah. Um, and Patrick and <laughs> Kai, they they saw it before. Like I was just I was trying to figure out the, the code. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did you? So I heard you guys had a fully functioning login system. Um. Well, now we do. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so you went back and finished the logging system. Yeah. I don't think it's <laughs> Can you explain how does a logging system work in C through terminal using many of that? So essentially, um, the registration page, um, when you, I created a struct for user, it stores username, password, full name, like all the stuff you saw in the uh, registration page. And when you click the register button, it essentially saves, saves all that with um, into the struct, and then when and then stores the struct in an array or a linked list of all the users. So you can have as many users as you want. And then when you when you go to log in, it I create um, it basically <coughs> use it. I have a function called login pass um, with two parameters, the username and password. Those. Are, um, to get those, I you know grab them from the text box by the title or the name, the text next to the um, text box. That's how I identify them. So grab the text from those, pass them into that function, and it goes through and checks those username and password combinations <coughs> with all the um, users in the array or the linked list, the users linked list, until it finds one which it matches, and then it returns that that user struct so that you can like. Go to the appropriate role, like doctor, physician, and that actually all works now. <laughs> wow. I just yeah. pushed that. Wow. So, yeah. so, how does the linked list persist between different iter like pieces of the program? So we just have a struct that we kind of just piled a bunch of stuff in. It's um, uh, we just created a struct kind of um, that we pass around through like the key hooks and the as a parameter for the key hooks and the loops and all that. So through that, you um, we have inside that struct we have like the um, the link list of users, the link list of text boxes, and essentially like the thing you need throughout the program. So it's sort of a way of doing global without hacking. Is it following on? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How many lines of code is it? Does it com does does it norm? No, 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 no. no, 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 no. <coughs> um, how many lines of code? Less than ten thousand or more than ten thousand? <laughs> Less than ten thousand. Less than five thousand or more than five thousand? Less than five thousand. Probably than under a thousand lines. Is it under a thousand lines, like six. over five hundred lines? Maybe around that. Okay, that's pretty five hundred. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. Because like my um, pretty my. Pretty Authentication, um, authentication file and um, text box is like maybe 150, 200 lines, and then like some of the other stuff is really long because it's kind of hard coded. Um, That's awesome. I don't know. I tried, you know, I 
if I had more time, I would um, create like structs for text boxes or for buttons and make that more automated, less you know hard coded. But essentially, I mean it's functional. <laughs> My side project is basically a small machine learning project where uh, I'm trying to predict, uh, it, it's a student intervention system where I'm trying to predict uh, whether a student would fail or pass based on some features <coughs> which are provided by the school or by the new student system. And uh, it's like a bunch of maybe 30 odd features where they're uh, varying from uh, the education of parents to what job they're doing to how much time the student is putting into studying and how much free time he has and what are the past failures and successes of the student. And I'm almost uh, done with the project where the prediction accuracy of the estimate that I built was around 80%. But since the data set was very small of about 300 odd students, it, it's pretty decent. Basically, I'm using decision trees, which is nothing but uh, a bunch of if-then-else rules. So I take one feature, I apply the rule on that, then I take another feature, I apply the rule on that. So I mean, it's it's it, it's called machine learning, but it's mostly you know like decision trees, which are pretty basic if-then-else rules. And yeah, that's about it. Maybe next week I can show you a demo. So, so you do implement the binary tree basically, and you traverse through the binary tree? No, it's not really a binary tree. It's it's a decision tree, right? So I I have some condition on each node of the tree, and if that condition is satisfied, I move through the two different branches. Basically. So it's a backward search where like you you have a neighboring uh, nodes. So I'm I'm predicting it. So it's not really searching. Oh. Right? So based on some data, I made the tree which has some conditional nodes, right? Nodes with some conditions, and to predict, I give it some data which, so let's say I give it a student who's studying less than 15 hours, and my first node says if the amount of time put in is uh, less than 13, you go to the left branch or you go to the right one. So in this case, it will go to the right one because it's more than 13. So like, how many nodes are there in that? Uh, so it, it can vary basically, right? I can go ahead and put as many nodes as I want, but uh, it, you, you tend to overfit your estimator in that case. Um, overfitting basically means it'll perform good for the training data, but when you actually try to predict it using some unknown testing data, the output would be very bad. I know you were talking that you had 30 conditions. Yeah, so 30 conditions. I am using approximately five to 10 conditions. Okay. And you can actually vary the depth of the tree you want, but the more deep you go with less data, the more you tend to overfit. Mm -hmm. So even though the training set can give me an accuracy of 100%, the unknown testing data would give me an accuracy of let's say 60, 65%. So I had to make sure that you select some particular set of features and train only for them instead of like going for 100% accuracy in the training data. So yeah. What would be a use case for this type, kind of approach? Uh, it has, I mean, with the current data set, it has no use case because it's really small. And like would the badges be like someone in, like a teacher would want this? Yeah, a teacher would want this if the estimator is trained accurately with quite a lot more data because 300 students is nothing as compared to to, to actually have a good accuracy, right? If you, I think an accuracy of more than maybe 95% would be a really good help uh, to, for, for, for an actual use case for this. But say, I mean, it's, it's a small project for a course I'm doing uh, on machine learning, so. Hmm. so interesting. Uh, so which language or uh, which technology do you use? So I'm using Python and oh, I'm using the uh, scikit-learn uh, Machine learning framework for that. 
be really cool to see your code. I've thought a lot about this kind of stuff, uh, but I've never actually seen it like implemented in code. So uh, yeah. if you found that out for like a future demo of Dave. Yeah, but next okay. week I can uh, show you the code and the decision tree and see how it looks. Yes. What course are you taking? Uh, it, it's a uh, course on uh, nano degree course on machine learning, but uh, from Udacity. Udacity. Yeah. Um, would you say that decision trees are kind of like a core fundamental of uh, machine learning, like, or and like, do you think it would be applied to every single machine learning? Project. Absolutely not. So okay. uh, decision trees, uh, like there are multiple algorithms which you can try, which I actually did, yeah. and then went for decision trees be because it was producing the best results, right? Mm -hmm. And you can have decision boundaries instead of trees if you are doing some kind of a classification problem. Uh, even this is a classification problem, but in this case, since we had loads of features, like 30 odd features, maybe the out of which five or ten features make sense. So it just it gave a good accuracy score and uh, yeah. All right. So then the decision trees are more like a tool in the toolbox or a tool set Absolutely. than they are anything yeah. else. But they are a, a tool that is very apt and used in the, the right situation. Really, yeah. If that's the whole point of uh, machine I mean you can just set up the code, it's not that difficult. After all, you're using some library, you're sending it some training data with some hyperparameters. So one of the hyperparameters being how much maximum depth I want. Right? Even that, you can do a grid search and make the algorithm find the best depth for you. And the code part is not difficult, but figuring out for which problem, which algorithm to use is difficult because, I mean, when you're dealing with loads of data, you don't have the flexibility to train it on every algorithm. The, the library which I'm using is, is only using the CPU. So the scikit-learn framework on machine learning is, is just based on the CPU. But in real world scenarios, it's, it's actually the training is done on GPU. Sorry. Which are infinitely scalable. Yeah, infinitely scalable. But, but again, the data increases. You, yeah. I'm sure the companies would be training on multiple algorithms. some personal analysis on it, and I decided to turn that into an app to make it easier for myself to do, and um, also allow other people to use it. Um, another benefit of allowing other people to use this is, one, I'm sh spreading it well, uh, but I get to now have a much more robust set of data on when the best times of day to drive are, and which, the which are the best restaurants to deliver for. Um, so, that you 
delivered to uh, the date, the tip, a couple other things. Uh, but that's all one delivery. And my whole data set is a big list of deliveries. So essentially, that's just a whole bunch of instances of an object of deliveries. Uh, so that's why I decided to do a photo. How many drivers does a Thousands, thousands. Thousands? Yeah. So as you expand this product, uh, I'm assuming you want to sort of maintain it within, because say everybody has this product, right? Uh -huh. In the Postmates community, how sure. do you make sure that they can get enough benefit from, from using it? You know what I mean? So well, if everybody so, has it, so if you're a Postmates driver and you're trying to think like, well, okay, so yeah. Eventually, there's probably going to become a point where it's like, okay, I know when the best times to drive are, and I know what the best route times to drive are. And then it's going to become less effective on that grounds, although those things can still change over time. But what it also provides is a really nice record for your personal use of the money that you've earned, how, like the days that you've worked. So you can look back in a month and say, this is how much money I made this month. Or you can, uh, oh, and then another thing that I've been thinking about is like making it also a little bit social. So like saying like, oh, this person made the most money. How did he make the most money? Um, stuff like that. You, uh, you said it might become less uh, productive mm -hmm. once a lot of people are like delivering at the same time. Yeah. Or whatever. Um, one thing you could do is sell that information to restaurants so they start behaving in a fashion that's more useful for the drivers. Um, what would their incentive be to change their well, performance? So that they have more, to, uh, more orders. Yeah, there's a big incentive for that. Um, I'm not sure how much value I could deliver on that front, but restaurants are definitely interested. I mean, I would deliver to places that I think are doing predominantly, maybe not predominantly, but a lot, a lot of Postmates sales, a significant percentage on a daily basis. And then you have places like Montreal, which is now just a restaurant that only does delivery, essentially. Um, so yeah, there's a, it's interesting actually doing the driving, you can actually see steps that there's like an evolution going on in how restaurants are organized um, and they're catering more so towards these delivery drivers because they're getting so much of them. So like whereas if I went into Tender Greens like at the beginning of the year in January, I would have to wait in line. When I went into Tender Greens in April, I went right to the front, went to the side, and they had a person there just doing <coughs> post deliveries. So there's definitely an evolution. As soon as you do a delivery and receive like the tip, or is it like after your day is done and you sit down and you start? Yeah. Putting so that's the biggest, by far the biggest downfall of the idea and the app. It's manual data entry. So you basically have to look at this line by line list, and there's only four pieces of information in each line item. Most deliveries that I could do would probably be 20. So it's not an incredible amount of data, but if you get behind, you're, it's it's like fuck it. Like e even for my own app, I'm like I don't even want to do this. So how would you incentivize? Uh, That's a good question. Yeah. Uh, I should think about that. I'm hoping that there will be a little bit of an incentive um, just from the information gained, and there'll be people that are want to be first movers and interested. Um, and that'll gain some momentum. And then from there, there's some gamification and social aspect that I could add into it. That might add a little bit of an incentive, mm -hmm. but uh, it's something to think about. You could partnership with the brand. Like, like once you get some traction with them, creating that post and being like, hey, you want to give me access to your API? Yeah. yeah I mean, you want to give me access to your database so that we can make this like really work for both of us? Yeah. Like that's like, yeah. Like, once you have traction, once you have value that you can show, like, hey, I have these posters. Like clearly the posters, we as we as posters drivers have organized ourselves 
you have this. Yeah. I fucking built it just getting the data. Yeah. You, you have it. That's, I got a, the data. that's a good like that's a good play. And then you can just eliminate your mainland fee entirely for those that have access to the postmates yeah. side of things. That'd be great. Another thing I considered was if people wanted to take screenshots of their you of their data that. and see if I could process that. Yeah, I think that'd be really cool. Yeah. What's up, Dan? I mean uh, a simple idea would be since it's already a mobile op uh, optimized, mm -hmm. you could have a thing that like after every single um, maybe like a uh, mobile app would look a little different, mm -hmm. like just to the data uh, input. Mm -hmm. Just after every single delivery, you can just enter in like the information about it, so it's not like building up for mm -hmm. you when you get back mm -hmm. as you're out. Mm -hmm. It's just it's a kind of like how you could deploy this. Mm -hmm. You just say the end user is. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So that's like the second step because I'm like still teaching myself um, the basics okay. of like connecting everything. A couple of weeks ago, I didn't, I, didn't, I had no idea how to connect it back into a front end. Okay. So now it's kind of like building those. Um, so I actually recently I was working with Python with the, the hackathon project, and I'm maybe rethinking do I actually want to do it in there? Because I really enjoy Python, it was, and I was thinking, well, even though maybe I'm not supposed to be using SQL for this, maybe I should uh, just use SQL because I like it. Mm -hmm. But basically it's the first step. Slack API will come after. Um, or maybe I'll get bored of the first step and just move straight to Slack API and start fucking with it. Oh. Just like what? I probably end up doing that, to be honest. <laughs> that's how my mind works. But, uh, What's, uh, what progress did you make since the last time? <laughs> Actually, no, that's not true. It's 100% not true. So, uh, I started working in the UI, right? That was a huge thing to me because I, I didn't like, um, I don't know, I just want to look nice because I'm not going to be working with it a lot. Like I want it to look nice. So I started doing that and then uh, I went back to my dorm and I was on my laptop. And if you guys don't know, I have like a crappy Chromebook. It's like one of the very first Chromebooks that came out. And I don't know how I've been able to work on it. Like I've booted Linux and like before it was fine. But recently I have noticed it's reaching its end uh, and it's kind of laggy. I noticed it specifically with the Inbox app. Uh, so if you don't know, Gmail uh, has this new thing called Inbox. It's like a minimal material run of Gmail. Uh, and I started using that as Lightning API. Right? So I switched to the HTML version of Gmail. 
And I ended up really liking it. Like, I actually really liked that because I don't care about really what my inbox looks like as long as I can feed the information. And that kind of said, like, kind of like spoke to me on a spiritual level. <laughs> <laughs> spiritual inbox. Yeah. Uh, that honestly, like, and I started thinking about like Reddit hacker news. They all have like this trend. They don't really give a crap about what the UI looks like as long as it's clear information. That's really only what I care about. So I started like doing a whole. Basically nothing to make. <laughs> wow. That sounds awesome. Yes. Cool. 
lots of different power moves because of that. So, yeah. Woo. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Vincent and somebody back there. Hey Zach. Yes. So I I, in the <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, I came into this um, knowing C and not much more than C. And after a certain point I realized that past pitching big ideas I would not be of much use insofar as the actual coding. So I thought that the best thing that I could do after looking over all the materials on hackathons was to do market research and to determine what was the best way we could pitch this to win things. And after talking to a number of teams, I realized that all of them were, were mainly pitching patient-centered approaches. That is, how can we benefit the patient? How can we help um, the industry as a whole? How can we build this thing that will make healthcare better? But the main focus of teams for the most part was not how can we make a pharmacist's life and how can we produce a product that will frictionlessly integrate into what the pharmacist's life to make his life easier. And I realized we already had something very much like this. So at that point, I thought, well, who are the judges? And how can I construct my pitch in such a way that the judges will like it, knowing that we have a product which is very much aimed at the <coughs> pharmacist already? So I talked to the French people, I looked at the judges, and they are associated with a collective group which is comprised of like nonprofit pharmacies. They're very big on public good and social benefit things. So I figured how can we pitch our product in such a way that it will immediately appeal, appeal to and want to be implemented by people in small pharmacies which are not connected to major brands. Um, and so in my presentation, or in our presentation, um, I directly talked about small pharmacies, about the need of these for logistics and, and inventory capabilities that large pharmacies didn't have. And I linked what was already an amazing product, which we designed, into what I felt the immediate needs of the judges would be. Because of the team at Facile Farm, three are pharmacists, two are marketing people, and one is involved in programming. So I assumed at least one of the judges would be a pharmacist. So the pitch was not going to be how can we talk about how good this is as a programming endeavor, but also how can we sell this as an idea to pharmacists and to people involved in pharmaceutical marketing. And that's how my little part of the pitch came together. Thank you. Hey guys, uh, my name is Stefan. What I'm building currently is a marketplace application where people can buy and sell items uh, with confidence. So um, confidence, um, what do I mean by confidence is that um, if we, have you ever used, have you guys ever used uh, Praxis or Opera? Yeah. You know, sometimes um, you're not sure whether this person is scammer or you know, maybe they may not show up at that location. And um, currently um, Praxis has um, you know, email notification where you can send email to you know the seller, and OfferUp has uh, in-app uh, messenger where you can message them. Um, so my app, what my app offers is that um, my app has in-app purchase where uh, you can uh, purchase the item uh, through my application, and I collect a fee, a small percent percentage of the fee, and also we, I have a in-app message where you can uh, message back and forth using my application. Also, the one unique feature of my application is that we have a, um, I have a, a video chat feature where you can actually video chat before you, know, you actually go meet, meet this person. So in that way, you know, people can feel more, uh, more safer or more confident that this person is actually willing to um, buy or sell the product. So yes, that's my app. And currently, I'm working on, working on video chat feature. If you guys have any questions. So what are you using for the video chat? Oh yes, um, I'm thinking uh, there is a um, gem called, um, I 
I forgot the, what's the actual name, but it's something like video test where you can use your API, but you probably have to pay a fee um, for a certain um, threshold, uh, threshold, after the certain threshold. But yeah, uh, that's what I'm gonna use. How have you organized? Um, I actually started um, two months ago, and when I, when I first started, I was, actually I had no idea, like, how, how to get started, like what features I should implement um, since the start and everything. But um, yeah, actually I learned Rails, um, Ruby on Rails, maybe I would say five months ago. I picked it up real quick because I was, I th thought about this idea after um, buying my MacBook Pro on, um, through Praxis. And I was like, oh shit, you know, there should be a better way of dealing with this person because like, <coughs> so, so I want to tell you a story, how I bought my MacBook Pro. So like, I was really desperate of looking for like good MacBook, you know, because I, I was interning at some company and I got a, you know, good money and I want to replace my MacBook Air with MacBook Pro. And I was searching through practices and oh, this person has a good, great deal, you know. This guy was selling a MacBook Pro, you know, 15 inch uh, for like uh, two, uh, two, um, uh, 1,200 bucks. So. 20, 12, 12K, uh, 1.2K. And I was like, oh shit, it's a really good, great deal, you know? Um, but I texted this person, hey, are you available on this and, you know, this time? And he said, yeah, definitely. And we met at the Starbucks. And I, when I, once I got into Starbucks, and this person was hes hesitant, you know? Because whether I'm like, I'm like a, a criminal or not, you know? <laughs> He's like all nervous and stuff. And I was like, hey, oh, why are you nervous, you know? You, you might steal my stuff. I was like, what? No. I, Did you show up in your turtleneck? <laughs> because no, no, you no, would no, not no, have been a criminal at all in your turtleneck. Wearing, yeah, I was wearing jeans, a normal, you know, like a normal person. And, you know, I was smiling friendly, you know, maybe he thought, saw me as a psychopath and maybe I, I smiled too much, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, I, I went inside Starbucks and I talked to this guy, hey, don't be nervous, you know, I'm not going to steal your microphone and run away. And he's like, okay, all right. And we sat down, like, together and I put my money on the table and he was like, hey, don't, don't put the money on the table. Someone might steal it. I was like, what? <laughs> Dude, like, it's cool, you know? And like, he got all nervous and he actually had to count the money in front of him so that like, I, I was actually paying this money. So from that experience, um, I realized, you know, you know, there should be a better way that people can trust, you know, uh, before they meet up. And the one, Unique feature about this app, another unique feature about this app is there is a trade history where you can view with the rating and the feedback. So that okay, this person actually sold stuff before, you know? Then then you can you can like even trust better, right? And also before you sign up to sell items, you have to actually create a like um WePay account. Have you guys heard of WePay? It's like a Stripe, mm -hmm. but it's a new newer um startup. Is it built into WeChat? No, it is. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's not. Uh, WePay is an American company, and oh. yeah, I think they're doing better. They got a lot of funding. And I'm using their um, API, um, transaction API, and you have to create that in order to sell stuff. So there'll be much less um, scammers on there because after your email, email registration, um, you have to go through this, um, um, this account. Um, you have to sign up for this account in order to sell. But you can still browse through, you know, the, the posts and what people are selling and stuff. But, but if you're buying, you don't have to uh, register for the WePay account. Question? Why WePay over Stripe? Um, great, uh, good question. Uh, the reason why I chose WePay over Stripe is that um, I, it, I'm a Rails developer and I had a hard, hard time um, <laughs> building a marketplace um, application yeah, with Stripe. Yeah, it's a pain. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, um, and WePay has done a great job in marketplace, um, API for the marketplace. So how, how do I collect certain percentage of every transaction is that, you know, um, WePay collects 3.9% of every transaction. And for me, I'm not, I don't want to be, I, I'm not greedy at all. I'm not greedy at all, at all you know. I only charge 1% of, um, with added with 3.9, so total 4.9. But you don't have to, you, you can only pay in cash, you know. You can only pay in cash whenever you meet, meet with other people. But if some people, you know, just like the person I met at the Starbucks, 
if, if the, those people aren't sure about this cash payment, you can use, use my um, in-app purchase. So, so you can ensure that you're getting the cash, real cash value. Uh, I have a question from a business standpoint. So uh, generally in marketplaces, you have this chicken and egg problem where what do you attract for these buyers and these sellers, right? I mean, for you to attract these sellers, you need to have buyers on the platform. For you to attract buyers, you need to have sellers on the platform. You have thought of how, how you would tackle that problem? Yes, yes. Um, so you're talking about user acquisition. Um, currently, I'm focused in developing the application so that making the UI really nice, you know, people can, you know, if you look at Craigslist, honestly, it's shitty, right? But people still use it because it's such a strong user base. And my, my goal of this would be building a user base. Um, probably, I know it's illegal, probably I can use web crawler to get the email, harvest the emails from <laughs> Facebook. Uh, yeah. Or, you know, just, you know, like, I mean, I don't have any connections. I'm trying to post on Facebook, you know, hey, try this app, you know? Yeah. And um, I, I'm, I'm sure that people would use it because it would be better than using Craigslist or perhaps Opera. Uh, so Facebook marketing here can be the real fun. So you know there's these Facebook groups there's these Facebook groups that like sell sneakers, right? Like, like selling, reselling sneakers is a huge market for that. Um, and so a lot of people do this via Facebook groups, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So if you like use, uh, if you do Facebook marketing segmentation to target these kinds of people, you're gonna, you could see some, some real potential there. Mm -hmm. um. I think this would be an interesting feature for your app. If you had like an escrow system, Oh. That's where, um, it's like with the WePay, like the person who's purchasing the app could pay the money, and they and you hold the money. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then uh, you don't disperse the money until both parties authorize that they're satisfied with the transaction. Yeah, actually, yeah. there's a um, there's a, in in WePay, uh, there's a trigger point where you trigger this transaction when mm. you click a button or something like that, mm -hmm. but. Uh, I should definitely take a look at that. And I actually email, I trolled the WePay um, Twitter account uh, <laughs> because I, was, I, want, I wanted to implement that feature, but they were like, oh, you have to make at least a million dollars in sales. So I was like, hey, come on, you know? But <laughs> what I can do is that I can um, hold the money um, like for, for, what, for, for, for a few days and then uh, reimburse it uh, after mm -hmm. um, after I get, I get um, feedback from the user. I get, um, yeah. So, yeah, that's actually. What I, I mean, and dealing with the repay API is kind of, kind of a little bit hard. You know, um, I should, I should, I should, I should definitely look into that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it also might not be something that your user base likes, but it's interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. Definitely. Thanks for the feedback. Um, so, I guess the main question I had. Um, so you're talking about having like a Say, you know, I think this is what Opera is doing right now. Is that um, they're gonna put your post to like on, on the top of the list mm -hmm. um, if you pay like 99 cents or something like that. So I can do that, but that's after once I get a strong user base. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I guess while I was waiting to ask the question, one of the things I thought of is maybe have it so people who are um, just joining. Uh, I was thinking like maybe having uh, new users <coughs> pair together 
Um, but then I realized that that kind of goes goes against like the whole question that I was asked is because you would have new buyers going to new sellers and they wouldn't want to go to the new sellers because they have no more space. So <laughs> When it's first empty, you could try baking a lot of posts so that it looks like it's busy. Oh. You can't do that um, when you're buying and selling stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because then they'll be like, oh, I want to buy this. No, if you have a bunch of shit to sell, you could make a bunch of accounts. <laughs> Actually, go through the whole getting users advertising thing. Could you actually document how you do that and then tell us how that goes? Oh, of course, yeah. definitely. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Why that would be <laughs> that, that'd be a great addition to the documentation. Yeah. That's really all I wanted to say. Okay, perfect. Two questions. One uh, question to follow up: Is this kind of like supposed to be an eBay replacement or a Craigslist? Uh, currently, it can be. If this project is successful, it can go even go against eBay. You know, I can add shipping shipping feature. And what I'm thinking in the future, in the future route, what I'm thinking is that I'm gonna start adding more companies, and they can actually create a post. But it's, it's gonna be, it's not gonna be like um, other individuals. It's gonna have a post that's not gonna run out. Um, so yes, currently I'm, I'm I'm targeted to my target market is resale market, and in, uh, in the in the best you know in in the future uh, definitely targeted for e-commerce. Because I was going to say, one thing that I haven't seen, like let's say you wanted to produce this as a hyper-local venture, you use AdWords and you use Facebook and you mm -hmm. geolocate all your advertising to target people into eBay, or sorry, to target people into East Bay. Right. Um, is a e-commerce platform that lets people specify where they'd like to receive goods or lets people specify where they're willing to give out goods? Now, I know in Craigslist people just list it, but at the same time you also see certain places like police stations, um, you know, certain cafes, say, list themselves as safe places where people can exchange goods. Uh, it might be interesting to allow people to list where they're willing to go to give goods, or, to, or for buyers to list where they're willing to go to receive goods. Because I, if I was buying on like some sort of Craigslist analog, would feel a lot better knowing that the person who was selling to me would be willing to meet me in a public place or say in the police station parking lot, rather than having me show up at their apartment at 9 or 10 o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. um, I forgot to mention this, but uh, in, my, in my application, I mean, I can, I can demo it in the future uh, once it's much, much, more, much, much better. Um, so what, what's the unique thing about this, uh, my application is that every post has a, you have to, you have to put the street address and address, the meetup location, mm -hmm. so that, and then I implement the Google Maps API, where you can, sh you can see um, where um, the pinpoint is, where the location is. So, so in, in my app, um, you know, in my, in 
my, in my post, um, you have to um, specify, um, I explicitly say on the, on the uh, notification, is to say, hey, you have to put um, public places, like such as um, coffee shops, or else, you know, um, your post will be removed if it's not um, uh, in the public places where there's a good Wi-Fi and people around you. So it has to be um, coffee shops or either uh, public places where people are around you. Um, all right, so this is, um, um, I'm thinking also that you can probably put something like, um, you know that, um, that Uber has um, this thing that you can like share your, um, like your trip with a friend, with, with um, a family or with somebody that they can see you like where you're going and they can keep a track of you. So I'm thinking that you can probably put something like, all right, I'm gonna meet this guy on Starbucks, um, um, on Starbucks, and I will probably um, uh, be there for um, 15 minutes, half an hour, and then if um, it passed that time, um, um, I don't know, like probably they can send an email to my um, to my mom, to my friend. And they can like call me and like, oh, um, 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 hey, um, um, are you done with the um, um, with the deal? Are you done um, with that? Um, I will reply back like yes, no. But if I don't reply, it probably means that something happened to me, like they kidnapped me or, or okay. something. Oh so yeah, yeah. So that's not really great. Really um, currently, I'm working. I'm just working on focusing on web application, mobile yeah. friendly web application, but definitely there, there will be a future for mobile app. Just like how like Airbnb got started, you know, oh. they initially started with yeah. a web application and their um, mobile application is really good. Um, you can um, see, you know, the location of the place and you can met, uh, um, text with the host and everything. It's definitely just, uh, I should look into that for future mobile startup that um, um, a couple of friends of mine um, started um, in Panama is called um, Ubicate, which is like a Yelp, a Panamanian Yelp, if you will call it like that. Um, the reason that we start this is because um, we realized that pretty much like there is no Yelp in Panama and TripAdvisor um, sucks. In Panama, it's not that great because um, when you um, when you wanna wait, all right. When you it's just working. Yeah, it's working. Give me my password. And let me just go. Is it set? All right. No, it's working. Oh all right. Mm. Yeah, it's working. Oh, all right. what a pretty thing. So um, the problem with um, with Trip advisor is that um, they're just um, putting like the most popular places, like places that everyone knows. Like, let's say that I'm coming to the States and I want to see what can I do. So probably like um, like an example, it will show me like, oh, if you are in Florida, you can go to Disney World. If you are um, in San Francisco, you can go to the Golden Gate. Um, stuff like that, so it really doesn't tell you like a lot of things to do. So this is pretty much what I have. Uh, the website is pretty similar to um, to Yelp, but like more um, simple, like a stripped down version of Yelp. So um, pretty much in this demo, um, I'm gonna show you guys what I made so far, and I also wanna. Um, get um, like a feedback of, um, of the 
design. And also if you have um, any more um, like, um, like ideas that we can probably put or, or um, stuff that you guys wanna say, you can ask. So, um, all right, so this is the main page. Uh, first, we have the categories, which is pretty much what you can do. Um, everything is in Spanish, but um, I will translate it, no problem. So we have economical, which is for like um, stuff that you can do for a very low price, something like $5, probably $10. Um, we have familiar, which is for family. We have um, vida activa, which is more like stuff that you can do outside, um, rock climbing or um, sports. We have um, gratis, which I'm pretty sure a lot of people know what that means. It's free, free stuff that you can do. Uh, popularis, which is popular. Um, popular, 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 something, all right. So um, it's pretty much similar to Yelp. We have like, um, the time that it is open, the places from 5 a.m. to 9 p.m. Um, and stuff like that. And the best of each category, like the best in Viva Activa, which are paintball, um, Seven Run, which is like a small um, mountain, if you wanna call it like that. Um, well, there's like a history place in there, so. Um, if somebody um, want to know about that, you can come later to me or to the story. All right, so in Lugares, we have the places that you can go, which pretty much are here, all the places um, um, in, the, um, in the right side, we have the categories, which are actividades, cultura, pretty much anything that you can do. Let's say that um, I want to go camping. I'm going to see what can I, where can I go camping, and we have two places. So it's very, um, it's more like um, for specific stuff that you can do. Um, let's say, all right. So we have um, senderismo, which is more like a trailing um, trip that you can go to. We have um, Parque Natural Metropolitano, which is a park, a national park. You can go um, pretty much that, like, um, let's see, what else? Um, rios, which are um, rivers that you can go. Um, yeah, that is pretty much it. We also have, like, this button, which is a random um, button, like, let's say that um, I'm not sure what to do today, like, I wake up, I want to do something, I want to have fun with my friends, but I don't know where to go, I don't know what to do. So you can pretty much click this button, and it will show you, like, okay, you can go to Playa Corona, Coronado. Um, yeah, that's pretty much what we have so far, pretty much like Yelp, pretty similar, actually. Um, here's the map where is it. You can pretty much open Google Maps. Um, the hours, if they have an Instagram, a website, a phone that you can call, a little bit of a description about the place, photos, and yep, that's pretty much it. So I don't know what you guys think. Do you have any feedback? Um, so my question is, I think, uh, maybe, I think, maybe, maybe um, in Panama? Uh, Panama. Yeah. Maybe it's different in Panama about how the web design should look like. Mm -hmm. But I feel like there's too much stuff um, in one page. Uh, I, my eyes are too like, busy. Maybe because I didn't learn another language. But yeah. it'd, be, it'd be nice if we can have some something more I'll say I'll say holistic. Yeah, well, um, that's a good one. It's like different in Panama. People like more stuff in the website. I, I, yeah, I think so. Yeah, because um, this is an example that we 
This is called the Gusta, which is also like the old drum. You can see that pretty much it has a lot of stuff. Uh, pretty much this is what people consider like professional looking website. Oh, yeah. I, I don't like it at all, but that's pretty much how they sell it. So are, are the places uh, curated? Are you guys choosing which ones to place them? Um, actually, we have only put like the places that we have go there just, just yet, but um, we want to put like a lot of places and we also want to put like um, um, like a system that people can put places and we can review it and accept it or, 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 um, or not and pretty much that so we don't have like to do all the work. And, yeah. uh, how does the review system work? Um, I saw the rating. Yeah. Um, um, five star. All right. Actually, this there is no review for um, for our users. This is um, for now. We are just doing like our own review of the place, and we were gonna oh. put it later on. Oh, so you're the one who reviews them. Uh huh. Oh, yeah. So yeah. for now. Uh, for now. Huh? I know one of the big things for me when I go to some place new and I want to explore is and. I don't think there is an app for this, even for America, is I want like some really unique local eatery. Yeah. That's like just, you know, like only locals go to and know about. And uh, I, I don't know if it was a conscious decision or not. I just didn't see the food on your website or, at all. Uh, thank you. <coughs> all right. Um, Vida Nocturna, there are um, bars, um, pubs. All right. I think we have those. Uh, all right, gastronomia, which is pretty much like restaurants, okay. but very specific restaurants, like probably um, something Panamanian or probably something yeah. Colombian. Um, very unknown places, like oh, this place is really really good. It's cheap, and, and they sell and they sell this stuff. And we still don't have anything there. Uh, I think yeah. uh, I think it'd be nice. Um, is it location based? Where let's say your city, blah blah blah, you can click on the <coughs> city, then it well, shows actually. Um, the thing is that my country is very small. very small. Oh. So, <laughs> um, like seventy percent of the people live in in the city, uh, which is roughly um, the size. It's a little bit bigger than San Francisco. That's it. I mean, like Orlando is bigger than Panama. Miami is bigger than Panama. So we don't need that. Actually, we were thinking of putting like um, um, in the provincias, which are pretty much like the states. There are ten, but um, there are not like a lot of stuff to do like outside of the city. I mean, more like um, doing. Um, um, like um, camping or, or, or to see like um, historical um, places or to do um, things that you can probably do like once in a while. So yeah, actually it's not like worth it right now, but we are like probably deciding uh, if to put it or not because we'll, um, we'll have to put like something in the, in the search bar. Um, well, um, we have tags like um, if you put, I believe, let's see, I don't know if there is any place here, no, uh, wait a sec, no, we still don't have any places, but we were actually going to put like, um, from the states, a tag in the places, like, okay, um, this place belongs to um, this state. So you can also like put this state in there and it will show you like, all right, here are the places. Uh, well, why don't you try by country? Like, because some lot, Latin American countries, maybe they're smaller size, so why don't you just um, do by country? No, they're all similar. Um, I mean, the city is pretty small. Like, um, and there are not like a lot of stuff to do. Actually, that's one of the biggest reasons that, that, um, that we started this because in Panama, all right, you can go to to places, but it's more like a once 
and one-time experience. Like, you go to this place and, all right, I've been talking, okay, I'm, I'm not coming back, like, what can I do? So actually, like, um, we are putting this so there are more um, unknown places that people can go, or like, oh, I like paintball, so I can probably go to this place, or I like go-karts. <laughs> So a big part of sites like these is, is information architecture, like yeah. how you actually organize the sites so that uh, users can kind of go around in like a natural way and like find similar things. Yeah. I was wondering what process you and your team went through in order to kind of come up with or right. you designed your uh, the, the, that architecture. No, um, well, um, the website, Sorry about that. All right, so here we are using WordPress. Actually, I don't like WordPress, but we are doing it right now because um, we start, um, I don't know, like eight months ago, something like that. Uh, we have almost 2K likes on Facebook. Uh, we pretty much have like a half done website because this like the version 2.0, this is pretty much what, what we designed from scratch which is more like um, easier on the eye, I would say. Um, let's say anything you like. It's like pretty much everything, um, everything box. Um, yeah. That's pretty much it. People didn't like this at all. They, um, they were like, um, um, this is so simple. Like, they, did, they didn't see a lot of stuff. Um, pretty much that, you know, like the opposite in here. Um, I mean, this looks good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think this looks really good. <laughs> I, I do like the uh, other logo you had where it was orange with the white ubicate. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, like, we changed it be because we previously so had, like, an orange in here, but, like, I don't know, people didn't like it, so, well, whatever. <laughs> so, um, we were doing it from scratch. This is the front end. It's all bootstrap, but it's like very hacked, like the <laughs> boxes are this and pretty much everything hacked. But um, the thing is that um, I started um, web development like a year ago only, and a friend of mine only started like, well, like pretty much like when we had the idea like eight months ago. So, um, we were like getting behind because we didn't have any experience previously on like in the back end. Well, I had like a little bit, but not that much to make a huge project as this, uh, as this one. So we had to go for WordPress for the meantime uh, because, all right, I'll show you pretty much what we have for the, uh, what do you call it for? Yeah, the CMS. All right, um, any more questions? Anyone on the CMS? So, uh -huh. um, is, your, is your target market primarily Panama? National, yeah. Okay. Primarily, but we also gonna use like, um, well, we actually, I believe we have like 10% um, of our visits. We get like, I don't know, should be number like 5,000 visits a month or 2,000 be between those like I think it, it goes like well actually it's like going this way right now but when we start we have like 6,000 and I think we are like um, 500 but that's pretty much the side of that we have you know like um, uh, this one so um, we haven't like updated for a month, uh, pretty much that's why I think we are going down. But um, we also find out that, well, we also um, find out that there's roughly um, from 10 to 15% of the visits are from the states, okay. like not from Panama, so people okay. are like, and pretty much everything is in Spanish. Yeah. So we are also gonna put it like in English, obviously, but 
Chrome this is pretty much what Chrome will translate for people. Yeah, yeah, but we wanna like No, 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 no sure, sure. Yeah. I'm saying like that, that might have been why it didn't have a, a lot of people from the the, the Oh, the well, oh okay, because okay, okay. Chrome will translate for yeah, people. Like, like the browser yeah. will they'll be like, hey, hey you wanna do you wanna translate, translate this? Yeah, yeah. 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 Right. But that might have been helpful. Yeah. Uh I don't know. Um, Right, so but is, yeah, yeah. Is that your like eventual? Is that your ploy though? Is to keep it pretty much a, a nationalist um, market, or are you trying to eventually oh. make it so it's outreach to different markets? Yeah, we are thinking of doing like um, for different countries. Okay. Because pretty much like all Central America, the countries are small, like right. pretty much like half the size of California or third part of Florida. Okay. I mean, pretty much um, small. So we are thinking of doing like internationally on that level. Um, probably South America too, but they are bigger and there are more stuff to do. So it's quite different in there. Uh -huh. All right. Yeah, I got you. Yeah. Um, can you go to one of the activity pages? Uh, yeah. Maybe even the one you were at, at before. Sure, play 300. All right. This one's for so, um, uh, like a specific page for a specific <laughs> activity. Alright. Yeah. What's, what's sex so? Um, so, <laughs> I think, so when we're talking about design, uh, uh -huh. something I noticed that it's not, I, I like websites that have a lot of information on them, as long as like I'm guided to the information through the design. Uh, so something I've noticed uh -huh. is, um, right here, I like the fact that you have like Google Maps and you have like preview pictures, but uh, with the big white space on the right. <laughs> right um, um, here which, is, well, well, we have like more of the pictures and we show here. Yeah, and I noticed, uh, I was thinking about the other one, uh, it, the same problem arise with the other one that also had uh, uh, pictures. Yeah, uh, all right. Um, we still have quite a bit of uh, white space. Um, <laughs> yeah, here is. Oh, wait. Pictures. No, it was, a, it was a different one. Alright, but, but yeah, um, okay, I guess. Yeah, we are gonna put like five pictures for each side, like that's the minimum. Okay, so, so that's it, the minimum. for sure it's gonna be filled. Cool. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, because pretty I much that's, we all, that, that's all we have right now, so we are okay, like okay. updating it. Cool, so, yeah. yeah. Alright. You could put a bunch of pictures of cats if you don't have a picture. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, like more but power yeah. low, probably like yeah, we can yeah, find yeah. or ads yeah. or ads. Oh, or ads. <laughs> that's, that's good one. All right, so questions? No. Okay, okay. I'm gonna show you the how we do it. Uh, all right, so we are using WordPress with a plugin called Geo Directory. Uh, we have pretty much the. Pretty much all the sites you can go. Uh, let's see this one. You click on here, and it's still gonna have the tab there. Wait, I'm, I'm gonna. Pretty much, this is how we put the information. We select the category, the picture. We actually have like the little arrow with the um, with um, our logo with the watermark. So actually, we are gonna like put the pictures. Pretty much like here, the country, Panama, region. We have the states. The I believe there were a lot of missing uh, the city. This is delicious. All right, so um, the map, we put the coordinates, um, the phone number if there's anything, um, the, um, the schedule that they have. Um, we see that from Monday to Friday, they're closed, but from Saturday to Sunday, they're open from this time to that time. Um, yeah, how much it costs, um, graphics free. Hmm. Can it fall off free? All right. No, it shouldn't. <laughs> All right. Uh, um, review prices. Go to Panama. Panama to put 
play paintball. Go to Panama. Paintball is free. There's also something called sexo. <laughs> Yeah, and that's pretty much what we have. Um, emails and Facebook, if they have Instagram reviews, and that's me, muy recomendado, which is like a very good place, you should go, it's cool. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much what we have. The thing is that since we are working with, um, with, with, um, with WordPress, I'm gonna show you some of the hacks that I have made, not from the hacker yeah. but you can see that. Pretty much how I well, me and my friend like managed to work around WordPress. Let's see, got the yes, maybe this one. You can see that the page is this, the content. Pretty much um, HTML, JavaScript. That's it. Uh, we have all the um, the names of the variable. I don't know. Nobody is familiar with that. Shit. <laughs> Roach tree scheme on your WordPress site? Yep. <laughs> so that's very helpful. What are you supposed to write there? Hmm? What are you text? To like, like plain text? Like, <laughs> like the info, like, oh, um, this page is about this. Oh, this, yeah. this oh, text. Yeah. And, yeah. and then the browser sees that and it's like, it just renders it because all yeah. a browser does is yep. read HTML. That's amazing. But we actually have to parse <laughs> that because. Uh, <laughs> It's gonna um, output like a um, RTF. It's called like real rich text yeah. format. Yeah. So we have like to work that around. We have to hack that so it didn't output it bad. Mm. So yeah. And uh, also like in the CSS, we also have like a lot of hack. This is pretty much the standard template. But you will see like when I go when I get to the um, big box. I have Book, like a big box. Big box. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm enjoying this website more and more. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty hacky. Yeah. I don't care as long as it's big. It's a All right. Well, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, it's, yeah. It's like very um, shit. Oh, uh, there it is. I don't know. I don't know how it uh, <laughs> shapes like this. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's yeah. like a very. It looks better uh, on my computer. Uh, it's like the uh, resolution of the screen. But yeah, that's pretty much that you have. Well, why is it spaced out like that? I don't know. It's um, I think it's just pretty much space? the. I think if I reduce the size. From white space. Don't, yeah, don't, don't break your. Website. Yeah, don't, don't break it from pressing. Uh, no, 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 I'm gonna see if I can. Like, what the fuck did you just fucking wait? Why is uh, that in there? Google the, <laughs> the greatest web dev tool ever created. Yeah. What? Well, whatever. It's a very stupid question. I will shit fury all over you. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so when we see that, yeah. So when we see that, it's um, pretty much like, okay, here goes the hacks from this CSS. And you can see, like, pretty much like we have remove a lot of um, titles, a lot of things from the widgets because it was taking a lot of um, space, pretty much displaying them everywhere, um, changing the uh, colors, um, the size, the borders. Did, did you see well, he had a lot of code to turn things off? Yeah. <laughs> because we couldn't do it like that. No, so, so, so is it easier office? to hack it or to just do it the right way? Uh, the right way, but since we didn't have like um, anything to work around, like, all right, I'm gonna show you like um, the template that we use pretty much. Uh, I don't know if you guys have any more questions. No? No. All right, so um, any more feedback? Mm -hmm. Shoot the yes. No, it's not this one, it's this one. But it's a good thing. Yeah, it's pretty good. WordPress looks like this. Yeah. So yeah, it's pretty much like Yelp, but you're gonna see um, pretty much what we had to hide, uh, what we had to do to work this around. See the difference? Like, um, we 
you have to do is uh, these spaces in here, the shadow, you use buttons, you make the whole menu again with the icons. Um, also with the uh, responsive design, you have to do this. Took me like, uh, no kidding, like 10 hours. Yeah, but so why? Uh, how, how to do it? Like, I mean, you see this? The difference, just to move that logo up there, I have like to have the um, the div, the yeah, um, yeah. orders, the output. Yeah. I had to uh, have the um, logo because it wouldn't accept um, SVG uh, pretty much without the SVG, so you need to do it on everything. Um, all right, so Responsive. anything else? How much money are you making with this website? Because it looks pretty damn complete to me. Yeah, but still, Makes a lot of work. I do. think um, one recommendation is mm -hmm. um, so I come from Puerto Rico, so yeah. I, I tend to see a lot of that uh, sort of same uh, copycat yell uh, yeah. things that they try to implement it locally. And um, the trend that I've seen is that the ones that really succeed mm -hmm. are the ones that don't really copy mm -hmm. like another product. It's mostly like based on their knowledge of, of the local region. You know, they take that knowledge and sort of take advantage of it. So this is your territory. Like you're from yeah. Panama, you know it better than anyone else who can build this product. Um, so I think one opportunity, one of those opportunities, is to sort of really, really make use of that knowledge to uh, yeah. to get advantage of, of the things you can do. And uh, so instead of sort of trying to copycat yeah. Yelp, my recommendation would be to sort of build something a little bit mm -hmm. different that serves the same needs, but does it in a way that that is specific to Panama. So that's pretty much it. Yeah, extending up to that, I think just doubling down on content. It's like right now, you, like, yeah. I think that like, at, at a certain point, it's like, this is cool and like, you can play with the UI a lot, uh, and like it's very valuable to do so, mm -hmm. uh, particularly taking the needs the particular market you're addressing. Uh, but like, there still isn't a ton of stuff up there. Yeah. And like filling up, like you do have like a, like a well-architected website, uh, but filling it up so that it, like when people go there, it doesn't seem like, oh, like there's not much happening here, uh, will definitely help you like keep and, yeah. and grow a user base. Because um, this is um, pretty much what we have um, under, um, under the show. Right, because um, nobody can see this but us. Mm -hmm. So we are like um, completing the like the design, and then we are like gonna um, I don't know pay someone so they can put the places because we want like about about fifty or one hundred before we actually like launch it again. Right. Um, we wanna um, have like five hundred probably before um, this um, before the end of this year. So it's gonna take a while. Yeah. But yeah. Also, um, it's really like if you can't like build mm -hmm. the website, you can also just kill categories. Yeah. Right. So it's much better to have like fewer categories that have 10, 15 places than to have a lot of categories that have zero places. Yeah. Um, so and then a, finding a balance between that and just like all right, fuck it, that's dead, that's dead, that's dead. Like you can always expand it later. Yeah. And then you can always bring it back. Like, yeah. And then it's like, ah, oh, we have more places, oh my god. As opposed to like, we are reaching our capacity. You yeah. know? Um, it, the, the impression that you leave on each user is always, of course, very important. And the user wants to feel, also if you're constantly bumping mm -hmm. at new categories, and you're like, oh my god, they're growing so fast. Like a little you know? new button. Yeah. yeah. Um, but don't like, like never <laughs> feel bad about cutting shit. Because yeah. that, is, that is where the shit starts. Think happen. about the uh, product hunt, for example, and mm -hmm. how they expanded those categories. Mm -hmm. We started without it, and sooner like yeah. they started adding categories. We are um, actually we are like cats, a few, a few um, um, categories from now. We want to put like um, at least one place. Um, I mean, like each okay. category to have one place, like at least. So um, we actually, at first, we had about 15, and then people told, um, told us like, hey, um, um, I didn't like see 
what I wanted to see. Because, I mean, let's say, um, I'm going to show you the page again. This is also like more of the Panamanian stuff, like they want to see everything on the website. All right, let's say that we had um, 15 only. Um, we didn't have camping, we didn't have dance, which is um, dance. We didn't have deportes, sports, <coughs> um, entretenimiento, which is entertainment. So um, people will look at activities and they will just talk about like one thing. And they, they didn't see like danza and they wouldn't check like activities because they couldn't find danza. So actually that's why we pretty much have like three uh, categories from now. We're gonna have like cut some uh, from now because of that, because um, I mean like we are already on December. Um, we need like to finish this up before the end of the year if that's our goal. So we are, we are gonna do that, but um, we didn't want to like cut a lot because um, people don't like changes a lot. Well, more in Panama, like if, they sh if the website changes a little bit, it's more like, oh, it's different now, you know. So we like, actually want to put like the decor, um, launch it, and then like, probably like um, put some categories from, from time to time, or probably just like um, do a little bit of the um, design, like, okay, um, I'm gonna change the color of Precio de Entrada. That's it. So people um, would have been like, oh, there's a lot of changes. But yeah, I like your idea. So like, yeah. Any more questions, feedback, design? That be important? So uh, remember that if you're not a collaborator on the repo, put your name in Slack, put your GitHub handle on Slack so I can add you. The method for demoing and the method for bringing guest speakers is through Slack, uh, is through oh. GitHub, through the repo, okay. by going to administrative folder and clicking on the corresponding document and just entering in your information. There's instructions there. They're very complicated. They say, fill in your information. Uh, we had like, like three weeks ago, we had like four people here. Yeah. <laughs> so this is awesome. Yeah.